starting Saturday, uh, Friday evening at sundown to consider uh, the desire that we all have, and that's to have a closer prayer life with you. Uh, from the fundamentally basics to realizing that there are huge principles that probably many of us have really overlooked. And tonight, as you continue to speak through Luke, your servant, uh, may you bless us again with your wisdom and discernment and your ability to just draw us closer and closer to you. May you be glorified again in this time together is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah, I was just going to put it up there, but that's fine. Okay, so we're going to do a brief recap just for, um, so that we're all on the same page. Friday night, the foundation of prayer is God is our Father, right? We have to recognize who it is that we're praying to. We're praying to our Heavenly Father. Jesus sort of made the prayer sandwich, and the bread is our Father. So he starts with our Father, and he ends with our Father. So we recognize that when we go to God in prayer, we're praying to our Father. And then for church today, we, we learned that we have to be real when we go to God in prayer. That's learning to pray. We're actually unlearning all the things that make us feel like we have to tiptoe around the bush before we can actually be honest with God. But God wants us to just be honest. What was it? We have rights. Because, exactly. Because we're his children, we can go to him complete honesty. And then this afternoon we learned about prayer and the word of God and how we need to claim the promises to us. We need to take what the Bible says and apply it immediately to us and hold on to it. And, and when we allow that to transform our prayer lives, we'll actually start praying the promises back to God, saying, Lord, you said this, you said it to me, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay hold of it. And so tonight we're going to get into the topic that is the major killer of prayer, and that is unanswered prayer. Now, raise your hand if you've ever, ever had an unanswered prayer. Okay, it's something we all can relate to. And tonight, I'm not going to try and, and, and give the all-end answer, right? Because we're talking about God doing what he does, right? And sometimes we just we can't answer something that God does. But the Bible gives us wonderful clarity on this topic. So before we do that, let us have another word of prayer. Father, be with us. Because Lord, we're going to open up your word and we're going to see what you say about when it seems like you're so silent. Father, there's so much in your word that talks about prayer. Prayer promises. But Lord, you have also talked about how we should respond when it seems like you are silent. So Lord, give us clarity and help us to see this picture so that when we leave here, we have been drawn closer to you and we are not afraid of going to your throne boldly and asking for all things because we know that no matter what, you will still be our Heavenly Father. For as is in the name of Jesus, amen. So the hard thing to reconcile is why we can read a promise that says, ask and it'll be given to you, knock and it'll be opened to you, search and seek and ye shall find. How do we deal with a promise like that and then sincerely laying hold of it and not having what we've, what we've asked, not having the door opened? How do, we, how do we reconcile these promises that God gives us concerning prayer when he remains silent. So we're going to look at some Bible passages that talk about the prayers that God, or reasons why God will not hear a prayer. So turn with me to Psalm 66, verse 18. We're going to go through some passages that, that give us a little glimpse into the mind of God when he will not answer a prayer, why he just outright says, I'm not going to answer that. So Psalm 66, verse 18, I can still hear pages turning, and we want to make sure everyone is, is on the same page here. Psalm 66, verse 18, amen, everyone there? 
Amen. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So if you're regarding iniquity in your heart, the Lord's not going to hear it. Period. That's just, it just says it. It's just blunt. Okay. Now, many of us here, we're not regarding iniquity in our heart. We're not keeping it. That's, I mean, we're here, right? So we're not holding on to that. Okay. Proverbs 28. Verse 9. Proverbs 28, verse 9. Another just very blunt answer from God as to prayers that he just will not hear. Is everyone there? Amen, amen. It says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer, is an abomination. So God says, if you, if you have heard the law and you turn away from it, if you know what is right and you do wrong, your prayer is an abomination. It's just blunt. That's, so, so, now, so now we know that if we regard iniquity in our heart, God will not hear it. If we hear what God wants us to do, if we hear his law and we pray, that prayer is an abomination. That's just, I mean, it's just what God is saying. But many times, many times, we know God's law and, and we're following it. We follow it to the best of our ability. We're trying as hard as we can not to regard iniquity in our own heart. But there's another, there's another verse in James chapter 4, verse 3, where God is incredibly blunt talking about prayer and a prayer that he will not hear. James chapter 4 Verse 3, talking about pride. Interesting. He's talking about pride. One of the very first, I mean, Lucifer, he became proud. That's how we got into this entire situation. Is everyone there? Amen? Amen. Okay, it says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Wow. So you ask for selfish reasons. And God, God says you do not receive because you ask for selfish, re- selfish reasons. So you regard iniquity in your heart, God's not going to hear it. If you know what is right and you turn away, your prayer is an abomination. And if you're only asking for selfish reasons, you're not going to receive. That's what God says. God also says that if you're not willing to forgive, God will not forgive you when you ask him for forgiveness. That's why in the Lord's prayer, he says, forgive us our debtors as we forgive those who trespass among us or against us. Some reasons, just very blunt reasons that God says, I'm not going to hear this prayer because there's something else that we need to work on first. Okay? But then the question is, what happens When we are praying sincerely, we have a walk with God and something happens. We have a loved one who gets sick and we pray and we pray and we pray. We do everything. We go, we get the the elders to go and anoint them, to pray over them. We do exactly what the scriptures say. We believe with full assurance and yet our prayers are not answered. How do we respond? How do we respond? It's difficult. And oftentimes when we when we hear silence from God in a, search, uh, a situation like that, our prayer life takes a nosedive because we lose faith in the power of prayer. We lose faith in the, in, in the fact that God is our Father and so his image is tarnished because of what we would deem an unanswered prayer. So we're going to look at some unanswered prayers from some of the saints in the Bible. Moses, first person. Uh, We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23. Now Moses, I'm incredibly envious of Moses. Ellen White even writes writes a a very lengthy passage on Moses was the most humble man. I read that and it it spurred within me a a desire to be more humble because I want to be as, as humble as possible. I want to have 
the, to the fullest humility. And she, she waxes eloquently about the type of man that Moses was, his faith with God. And yet, he had an unanswered prayer. Verse 23, Deuteronomy 3, 23, is everyone there? Amen. It says, Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. Moses is praying, Lord, let me go into the promised land. I know I messed up, but let me go into the promised land. Please, let me go into the promised land. But God doesn't let him go. It says in verse 26, But the Lord was angry with me on your account. It would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, Enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. He prayed, Lord, I just want to go into the promised land. I've been with the, I've been with the Israelites for, for so long. We've wandered in the desert. I've invested my entire life into this. That's been my only hope. It's the only thing that's, that's kept me going is that you're going to bring us into the promised land. Please, God, just let me go into the promised land. He never gets to go into the promised land. Unanswered prayer. Or does he? Or does he? He goes, he goes into the real promise. So, so Moses dies. And then we have some disciples who are with Jesus, and they get to see Jesus transfigured, and then there are two men with him. And who are these two men? One of them is Elijah, and one of them is Moses. And where are they standing? But what is the geographic location of where they are standing? They are standing in the promised land. So Moses cried out to God in prayer, Lord, I just want to see the promised land, and then he dies. The prayer unanswered. But Moses gets raised up. He gets taken to heaven. And then when Jesus is on the earth and goes up to be transfigured, Moses gets to walk on the promised land. The answer didn't come the way that he wanted it. The Lord was angry at him for asking. But his prayer was eventually answered. But it was way down the road. I mean, it was after his death that it was answered. Story number one of an unanswered prayer for Moses, kind of. Story of Elijah. We know about Elijah. Very strong prayer life. He prayed for no rain. And no rain came. And then he prayed that it would rain again, and rain came again. 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah has probably one of the strongest prayer lives in the entire Bible. And yet he experienced an unanswered prayer. Chapter 19, verse 4. He's running away from Jezebel. He's tired. He just had this mountaintop experience. He just, he just saw fire rain down from heaven as he prayed for God to manifest his glory so that everyone could see. I mean, who I would, I would have loved to have been there to witness that. And Elijah was one of the major players in that entire story. But in verse 4, but he himself went a, day, a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. Elijah prayed that he would die under a tree. I'm so thankful that God does not answer the prayers that we pray when we are under a tree under the tree like Elijah was. When we're tired, when we're exhausted, when we would just want to give up and we just say, Lord, take me. 
because I can't continue anymore. I'm thankful that God does not hear those prayers, that he doesn't answer those prayers. How did Elijah die? Oh, he didn't. That's kind of ironic. He asked for death, and he never dies. Why does he want to die? Because he wants deliverance from the situation that he's in. What type of deliverance does he get? After he learns his lesson, right, he gets taken up to heaven to where he doesn't even experience death. But yet he was praying, Lord, just let me die. I'm tired. I can't. I'm, I'm no better than my father's. But it's not answered the way that he wanted it to be answered because he's taken up in a chariot. I think that's just the coolest thing of all time. I would love to just never have to worry about, about dying, huh? It was better than anything that he had prayed for. So the Apostle Paul prayed three times, Lord, help me with this thorn in my side. And God says, no, my, my grace is sufficient for you. So sometimes we pray, and God's answer is just No. But this is the thing. This is the thing. When you're a kid, a very small kid, I mean very small, do you worry about what's in the refrigerator? What you're going to be wearing? Do you worry about the house bill or the water bill or the electricity bill, car payments? Why? Because it's going to be taken care of. Your father is going to take care of it. Your mother is going to take care of it, right? Your parents have it under control. I mean, I grew up poor, and I still didn't even worry about that. Because my parents, as a child, you just have the fullest trust in your parents that they're going to to take care of everything. Everything's going to be okay. And sometimes our parents tell us no. That doesn't mean we stop going to them as a parent. That doesn't mean we cut off the relationship. We don't talk to them for like four months. No, we're a little kid. And so when they tell us no, we get sad, we get frustrated, it's natural, but we still love them. We're still thankful for when they provide for us, but yet oftentimes the first time God doesn't answer a prayer that we urgently want to happen right then and there, our prayer life just takes a nosedive. Look at how Moses' prayer was answered. He got to stand next to Jesus in the promised land and encourage the disciples. Elijah, look at how his his prayer was really, he wanted to be delivered. He was tired of all the turmoil. He was tired of, of having to deal with politics and having to see all what the world was doing and all the wickedness. And how was he delivered? A chariot of fire. Most powerful example of an unanswered prayer. Turn with me to Matthew. The book of Matthew. Oh. Book of Matthew towards the towards the back end, I want to say chapter twenty five. Nope, it's past chapter twenty five. Chapter twenty seven. Chapter twenty seven. Matthew twenty seven. And we're going to be starting in verse 45. Say amen when you get there. We're talking about Jesus. And as a Christian, my faith is completely built off of the way that Jesus lived, the way that Jesus walked, what Jesus ate, how Jesus prayed, what Jesus spoke. Everything, if it, everything about Jesus, that's where my faith is. Somebody were to ask me, what is the Adventist message? I would say Jesus. Somebody were to ask me, what, where's my faith? It's in Jesus. Who do I love? I love Jesus. Who's my savior? My savior is Jesus. Most powerful illustration, most powerful example of unanswered prayer. Verse 45, is everyone there? Amen? Amen. Chapter 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth, 
hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is crying out to God as he's being crucified. He's crying out for God to be with him. He's praying. This is Jesus praying. And what does he hear? He hears silence. He hears silence. Now, Jesus knew, Jesus had full faith in what he was doing. Full faith. But his humanity cried out in prayer. Lord, where are you? Why why have you left me? Lord, come back. I can't do this without you. Silence. But did that break Jesus' faith? Not, it didn't even break the humanity of Jesus. Because Jesus fully trusted in that foundation, which was that God was his father. He trusted fully in that foundation. That's where we have to put our faith. There are prayer promises, and we have to hang our hat on them every time. We have to believe with full assurance that if we ask it, God will deliver. But sometimes it's not going to look the way that we want it to. I have a hard time because I've seen a lot of men die at a very young age. I have a hard time because my stepsister just got into a car accident and one of her friends did not make it. And I think, Lord, did this, did this, did this girl know you? So why would you allow this to happen? Because you want everyone to be able to have a relationship with you. And so why do, why do these things happen? And God just tells me, Silence. Why? Why would he say silence? Why would he remain silent? Because I'm the child. He is the father. He knows about the house bill. He knows about the electric bill, about the car payments. He knows about the food. He knows about the clothing. He knows about the protection. He created everything. I'm just the child. And I have to trust him like a child. Sometimes our parents say no. And they have great intentions for it. Because they are wiser than us. And so we have to trust, okay, Lord, one day down that road, my prayer will be answered and it will make sense. One day, even if death is in between that point or a fiery chariot ride, I prefer the latter. You never know which one you get. But we have to be willing to make that statement. It's funny because I have a friend who's a severe pessimist and I've never understood pessimism ever in my entire life. I'm an eternal optimist. It's pretty easy because I have a very powerful savior and so I can be an eternal optimist. I've been on some terrible hockey teams that have lost many times. One time, we lost 17 to one. That was crushing. My assistant coach got physically ill to where he went and vomited because he was so emotional about it. The very next game, very next day, I'm in the locker room getting dressed and everyone, I can see everyone's kind of heads are down. I say, guys, what's wrong? They're like, Don't you remember we lost 17-1 to yesterday? And I said, I don't care. That was yesterday. What about today? We got a new game to play. Who cares about yesterday? That happened. It's over with. Forget about it. We can win today. What's the difference? We just play better. That's it. We just have to play better than the other team. We just have to score more goals than the other team. It's that simple. And then everyone forgets that we lost 17-1. to Why can't we do it? We, we put our skates on the way the other team does. We get dressed the same way, play the same sport, same age. 
They're not better than us. I have a powerful Savior, so it's easy for me to be an optimist. No matter how many times I experience failure, I still get up. And I still put faith in those promises. Because I know if God said it, he is all wise. He knows the beginning from the end. And so even if death comes before I get that answer, I know that I will eventually get that answer. And if I'm at the candy store and I'm asking my dad for a bar of candy and I've got a mouth full of cavities, my dad's not going to give it to me. Why? Because he's looking out for me. And I can be okay with that. Because down the road, I will recognize, wow, dad, you were really wise. You were a good parent. Because you always looked out for me. Because I'm here and I'm alive and I have my health. And one day we're going to stand in heaven. We're going to be with Jesus. And we're going to be like, wow, Jesus, you were really wise. Because I prayed for that. I prayed for you for, so that I could die because I was tired of living in the world that I was living in. And you gave me life. You allowed me to live. And then I went and got married and had kids and got to see you work in many lives. And if you had answered that prayer a long time ago, I would have never been able to experience that. And so I'm thankful that you were all-knowing. But it's all built off that foundation. That's why, really, we could, just, we could just label the entire, everything on prayer is God is our Father. That's it. You want to learn how to pray? Just understand who you're praying to. This is my favorite prayer promise. My favorite prayer promise. I don't like to share anything that, that hasn't changed me personally. I think it's kind of criminal. If, if, it hasn't, if it hasn't touched me, it's just gonna be words. I'm just gonna be presenting. But I'd much rather just share with you what Jesus has done for me. Romans chapter eight. starting in verse 31, and how appropriate are the first words. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. My favorite prayer promise. Say amen when you get there. This is, Jesus is going to leap when we read this. All right, you guys ready for this? What then shall we say to these things? I like to think of, what shall we say to to prayer promises or to unanswered prayer. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God didn't even withhold his son from us, can't we trust him when he tells us no? Even if that no breaks our heart, we don't have to let it break our faith. Because he is the father and we are the children. There's a, there's a poem that it's from this man named E.B. Browning. And it's about unanswered prayer. It says, unanswered yet, the prayers your lips have pleaded in agony of heart those many years? Does faith begin to fail? Is hope departing? And think you all in vain those falling tears? Say not, the Father hath not heard your prayer. You shall have your desire sometime, somewhere. Unanswered yet, though when you first presented this one petition at the Father's throne, it seemed you could not wait the time of asking, so urgent was the heart to make it known. Though years have passed since then, do not despair. The Lord will answer you some time, somewhere. Unanswered yet? Nay, do not say ungranted. Perhaps your work is not wholly done. The work began when first your prayer was uttered, and God will finish what he has begun. If you will keep the incense burning there, his glory you shall see some time, somewhere. Unanswered yet, faith cannot be unanswered. Her feet are firmly planted on the rock. Amid the wildest storm, she stands undaunted, nor quails before the loudest thunder shock. 
She knows omnipotence has heard her prayer and cries, it shall be done sometime, somewhere. You see, friends, we should never let unanswered prayer break our faith because he is the father and we are the children. And if he gave up Christ for us to spend eternity with him, will he not freely give us all things that we need for our betterment? We're gonna be standing in heaven one day with Jesus and we're gonna be able to see why God did not answer our broom tree prayers when we asked him, Lord, just let us die or why he didn't answer our prayers that were out of anger or out of pride or anything like that because he's the father and we are the son or the daughter. And so next time your faith starts to wobble because you've been praying and praying and praying and it seems like only God has been silent, think of these two things. Christ experienced the same thing on the cross and two, two, if God gave Jesus for us, then he will give us all things. And think of that when it seems like God is silent and hang your hat on that. Let us pray. Father, Lord, none of us are perfect. And we have stumbled and we have fallen, but Lord, we are so thankful that you gave us Christ. Lord, we are so thankful that that though sometimes we call out to you in the direst of circumstances, Lord, for, for our loved ones, for our friends, and you remain silent, it is good to know that, that you are our Father and that we are your children. And so no matter what, no matter what, when everything comes to its full completion and we are standing in heaven, we will see your wisdom and we will be reminded of your love because, Lord, you care tremendously about us because you have drawn all of us back to you though we wandered off. Father, help us to never have our faith breaking, broken because you have not answered a prayer the way that we wanted it to. We love you, Father, and I thank you so much for this Sabbath day, for a day of rest where we can come together, we can fellowship, we can worship you, we can break bread, we can eat Triscuits, we can eat sandwiches, and we can just laugh and laugh and laugh. A little glimpse of heaven. Come soon, Lord. Come, oh, very soon. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, and we love you. Amen.